Welcome back. In this uh, video within our uh, data visualization section, I'm going to start th to think about how we visualize uncertainties within data. And that this is going to think, uh, at this point, I'm going to think not just about the distributions of data themselves, which is what we were focused on in the last couple of videos on, on density plots and histograms, uh, but also thinking about when what we're trying to visualize is actually a probability distribution that might come out of a statistical model. So if we have an estimate of a, a mean with some uncertainty, um, you know, how do we visualize those kind of uh, uh, uncertainties associated with models and their parameters as well? Uh, one thing that's important to know now that we're actually thinking about probability explicitly is, is it's important to be aware that humans can be really bad at ju judging raw probabilities. You know, if you say something like classic problems like if you say something has a one in a million chance versus a one in a billion chance, you know, it's very hard for the human brain to really comprehend the difference between those, even though there's you know, a, a factor of a thousand difference. Um, visualizations like this that tra translate uh, probabilities into amounts via frequencies are often easier for people to get their brain around. This one particularly does it by randomization. I think if you do it in order, it's also visually effective. So if you had a, you know, a 10 by 10 grid and one row is dark blue and the other is light blue, you know, it, it again gives a, a better visual uh, estimate of, of, of what we mean. So just in general, you know, we'll talk about this more in, in the next whole chunk of lectures on, on uh, kind of some of the theory behind visualization, but in general, you know, the human brain is, is good at perceiving length and, and size, uh, and we can translate these things uh, relatively easily. So here's an example of kind of taking advantage of color uh, within the plot of, of a density in order to kind of emphasize useful information. So here, uh, you know, say we're, this might be, um, polling data uh, from, from, for an election or something like that. And we might have an, a, a best estimate of a mean. We might have some estimate of, of an error. And what we really care about is you know, whether you fall on one side of that distribution or the other. And so here we visualize uh, you know, the probability of yellow winning versus the probability of blue winning in a way that, that makes that visually distinct, uh, which is much better than just plotting the dis density by itself. Uh, that said, um, this sort of you know, representation of area uh, can be, uh, it, uh, I guess I would say that the challenge with this is if I asked any of you to, to tell me how much area was actually yellow here, like what is that actual probability, it's kind of hard to judge it. Uh, you know, what fraction of that overall distribution is that yellow area, particularly because the shape isn't regular, like if this was a square or a rectangle or, or a triangle, it'd be easier to judge. <clears throat> so an option that can often improve uh, the visualization uh, is again to come back to this concept of frequency. So this, here's an example of what are called quantile dot plots. So we're plotting the density and then we're plotting um, these dots to help us represent, you know, discrete amounts. Um, here the top one is 50 dots, the bottom one is 10 dots. And so we're able to kind of put some estimate of number with estimate of, uh, with the shade of the distribution, and again, leveraging color. Uh, so in this one, you know, you can, you know, if you only had the bottom one, you'd know that the, the probability is, you know, in the 10% range pretty quickly, with the disadvantage being that uh, it could actually be anywhere from, you know, seven and a half to 12 and a half, no, actually, anywhere from five to 15 before you would switch to the number of dots. Uh, with n equals 50, we're able to get that down to knowing we you know, can quickly estimate the, the percentile within uh, about 2%. Uh, and so this would come out with six out of 50, so 12%. Uh, personally, I probably would have done 100 dots to make it easy to count up to 100. Uh, but if you make too many dots, uh, then you kind of just go back to, you know, smearing it all together and it just looks like a distribution again. Um, so you want to kind of think about, uh, you know, playing with that. 
but it is a useful way of, of representing uh, probability. Okay, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is one, probably the most, um, the way many of you have been accustomed to uh, seeing uncertainty and probability represented, uh, which is through the use of error bars. So I want to take a minute also at this stage to, to clarify what these different terms here are. So here at the top, we're seeing a visualization of the underlying data. So each of these green dots represents a data point or a, a chocolate flavor rating score. So clearly the data was discrete and it's been, you know, it's called jittered a little bit. So we've got a little noise so we can see the variability in the data. So it's falling in discrete bins. Uh, but we can still calculate a mean of that data. So this might be, you know, a zero to five rating on how good a, a chocolate was. And the standard deviation here is important because it's telling us about the spread of the data itself. So that one standard deviation is the, the calculation. We talked about standard deviation in the last set of lectures when we were talking about summary statistics. You know, it's the, the root mean squared error around the mean. Um, and so it's a statistical measure. And we know that, uh, you know, 1.96 standard deviations gives you about 95%. But importantly, the standard deviation is telling me about the data itself. Uh, next, we have a much tighter uh, error bar that's the standard error. Now, the standard error is telling me about the uncertainty about the mean. And so, uh, and that's a reflection not just of the spread of the data, but also the amount of data. So if I have more and more data, uh, my confidence about the mean gets tighter and tighter, and so that standard error gets smaller and smaller. <clears throat> so that's a really important distinction between standard deviation and standard error. Standard deviation, again, is telling us about the spread of some distribution itself, uh, and then the standard error is telling us about the uncertainty uh, of coming out of some model or parameter estimate. And very often, it's something as simple as the parameter being the mean, uh, but we'll see you know, later on you know, things like confidence intervals around uh, lines and stuff like that, where, you know, the, the uncertainties are around a model rather than around a mean, but they're still telling us about uh, that sort of estimate. And then after that, we have three different estimates of confidence interval uh, that, again, they're reflecting the uncertainty about this model, which in case this case is just the uncertainty about the mean, um, with different levels of confidence and the confidence interval always is giving us two points, an upper and lower bound, uh, and it's representing uncertainty in terms of the quantiles of, of some distribution. Uh, and when we get to regression, we'll talk a lot more about uh, what confidence intervals actually are and how they're calculated. Um, cool. So, one obvious choice uh, when you're reporting data is which of these error ball bars to represent. It depends on what question you're asking. If you're asking a question about the mean, you're going to be using one of these lower four. If you're asking a question about the data itself, you're going to be looking at the standard, the distribution of the data itself, like the standard deviation. Um, and then visually, you know, these different intervals uh, represent different quantiles. And so you have to be really clear uh, anytime you're reporting error bars about what those represent. Do they represent a standard error, two standard errors, confidence interval at 80%, 95%, 99%, 90%, like what does the interval represent? Um, this figure uh, represents ways of, of, it represents two things. First, uh, our ability to use these error intervals to compare across different things. So it, error intervals make comparisons across distributions very easy, uh, much easier than they were when we were plotting the full density. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing we're seeing here is a clever way of plotting uh, multiple intervals at once. So rather than making a choice to plot just the 90%, 95% confidence interval, but it's actually emphasizing, you know, kind of using line width and color, kind of a bit about the spread of that, that distribution around its mean. Um, and again, you know, since these are about parameter estimates, the, that spread is, is really not about the spread of the data itself, it's about the uncertainty. So the US estimate is very tight, presumably because there was a lot of people in the US surveyed about the, and again, this is chocolate quality, uh, and Peru is much wider because there was less data in Peru, not necessarily because there's more variable answers. Uh, this next slide shows uh, a, a number of different ways to kind of visualize 
these uncertainty estimates. So uh, the first panel A is just a repeat of what we had on the last panel uh, with the difference because I think we're now normalizing it relative to the US. It's now plot is the difference from the US. Um, but it's the same information with the same multiple error bars. Uh, B is that same plot now with the uh, N bars removed, uh, which, uh, you know, I think there's a trade off there. If you remove those end caps, you, um, you know, kind of use, it makes the ends less visually distinct, but that can be helpful uh, when you're visualizing a lot of things because those end bars can be visually distracting if you have a lot of, a lot of things to visualize. But, you know, in general, you know, I, I tend to like those end caps. Uh, C and D are versions of that same thing. We were only looking at one error estimate. Uh, and all of A, B, C, and D all in this case were rendered using in ggplot using the geom error bar, which is something you would add on top. So if you've already plotted you know, the points, you would then use you know, add the geom error bar to add the error bars around the points. And these last two visualizations are a bit more advanced. One you know, is plotting multiple densities, uh, kind of using you know, uh, density plots like we've talked about before, and then this composite strip, uh, which is a bit more complicated to print, is using transparency to represent probability distribution density. So the darker the color, the higher probability density, the lower the color, the, the lower probability density. So it's kind of, I kind of think of this as like if I was looking at the plots in F, like from, from above, um, looking down on them, and they were transparent, I would see a lot of density versus less density.